this little introduction. Um, so, Good afternoon and welcome to day three of the University of Maryland St. Joseph's Medical Center Cancer Institute Survivorship Week 2021. We put together an exciting week of virtual events that we know will interest, support, and serve you and your family wherever you are on your cancer journey. Our dedicated and talented staff at the Barbara L. Posner Wellness and Support Center and throughout the entire Cancer Institute are part of our events that you will not want to miss. Please share this week of events with your family and friends and all are welcome. And check out our website at, at umstjoseph.org slash superhero for a complete list of events, links, and links to each virtual event. Let us know if you have any questions that you might have. You can certainly call me at 410-427-2598 or email me at cancerwellnesssupport at umm.edu. So without further ado, I'd like to present Dr. Jennifer Moran, who earned her doctorate at the University of Denver and has spent her career dedicate, dedicated to helping individuals and families across the lifespan to work through a variety of mental health concerns. In addition to her work at the Wellness Center, Dr. Moran specializes in the treatment of eating disorders at Eating Recovery Center of Maryland. She also has a passion for providing outreach and trainings to professionals to the community and is a frequent presenter and lecturer. She also developed and led collaborative caring workshops for many years that were designed to provide skills, strategy, and support to people who are caring for loved ones with an eating disorder. Since this experience, she has continued to have a strong interest in providing support to those individuals who are in the caregiving role. So without further ado, Dr. Moran, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. And I hope that if you're watching this now or if you're watching this in the future that you've decided to take a little bit of time to um, maybe practice a little self-care by learning a little bit more about some tips and strategies to reduce your stress if you are in a caregiving role. So when we were first talking about potential topics for things to talk about this week, this was something that came up as something I wanted to really highlight. When I work with people at the Wellness Center, there's a few themes that tend to come up across lots of different people's lives. And being in a caregiving role is something that comes up quite a bit um, because I think a lot of people are really stressed about trying to navigate their own treatment and also trying to figure out how to balance the responsibilities and obligations that they have to people that they're providing care for. So hopefully today we'll talk a little bit about what some of the specific stressors for caregivers are, but also talk about some really specific things that we can do to help bring some of that stress level back down. So speaking of stress, whenever I have my first session with a client, I often ask what some of their therapy goals are or what are some things that brought them to counseling. And almost across the board, I always hear my treatment team told me I have to reduce my stress. So there's a recognition that they have a very high level of stress and that that's not something that's recommended. And so people are often coming in looking for some skills and strategies for how to cope better and how to reduce those stress levels. I always think it's a little ironic that we're giving that message at a time when people are usually really stressed out. So, you know, at the Wellness Center, we see people across the spectrum in terms of people who are recently diagnosed or going through treatment or maybe even into survivorship, but all of those different um, places have their own stress accompanying it. So recognizing that the stress level is going to be high, I wanted to spend some time just talking a little bit about that and what we can do for them. So where does the stress come from? So again, we have people at different points during their recovery process with some people just really finding out about the diagnosis and learning to accept it and trying to really find out as much information as possible. So, you know, really kind of trying to get their head around what's to be expected in terms of treatment, what options are available, 
um, what this means in terms of upcoming plans that they had. So that can be an incredibly overwhelming time where people are just really trying to kind of understand what this means for them and what the future is going to look like. And of course, that segues into navigating treatment and all the different medical appointments. Um, again, kind of understanding what's involved with that. For some people, it means having to change their work schedules or vacations that they had coming up. Um, and, you know, really just trying to figure out how to make it work with their life. If people have had a history of depression or anxiety, this is going to be one of those points in time where they're going to be more vulnerable for feeling more significant symptoms of those again. So for some people, they may also be experiencing an uptick in anxiety or panic or just feeling sad and down a lot of the time. We may see a difficult time with motivation, a lot of people complaining about not being able to sleep very well. And other sources of stress, you know, we hear a lot about body image. So sometimes, you know, people are having to face surgeries or, um, you know, they're concerned about their hair loss and feeling very sensitive about the changes in terms of how their body looks or how they feel physically in their body. A lot of people will also talk about the stress of just the diagnosis and treatment itself kind of presenting as an existential crisis. So kind of looking back and wondering, you know, what have I been doing with my life so far? Has, have I been living a life that feels consistent with my values? You know, what do I want to change to make my life feel more purposeful with the time that I have? Um, so a lot of times people are feeling kind of overwhelmed by that element as well. Because so many people do have to modify their work schedules, we also hear a lot of financial concerns. So, um, you know, treatment can be really expensive. Um, there's a huge loss of income for people who are needing to change their work hours or their work schedules. So we hear a lot of people really concerned about the finances. You know, when we're recording this is hopefully at the tail end of a pandemic and we've had lots of people who were already kind of stressed by just changes that were happening globally as well. And then of course, you know, honoring today's topic, we also see stress in terms of caregiving. So we have, you know, people who are really trying to navigate how to take care of themselves and how to navigate this treatment while also still providing care for other people. And a lot of times I hear people say, you know, I don't want to be a burden to anyone else. I'm the person that usually provides care. or I take care of everybody else. I just don't want anybody to feel obligated to have to do something for me. And so that can feel incredibly uncomfortable if people who are not used to asking for help are now in a position where they're needing some more support from other people. And then with treatment, but also with the pandemic we've had, we have um, a change in how accessible some of people's coping strategies are. So, you know, maybe something that you felt physically comfortable doing before no longer feels good to do. So, you know, maybe exercise is limited, um, certainly feeling more isolated socially. You know, many people have kind of reported feeling like they just didn't have the ability to um, really engage in some of those hobbies or interests that they had that would help them to relax or, or feel a little bit more joy. So all of this stress leads to some really common human emotions. So most often I hear people talking about feeling an increase in anxiety or fear or sadness or depression. A lot of people struggling with feelings of guilt, um, frustration and anger and disappointment and regret. And all of these, again, are really human, normal emotions to experience, but they're also usually experienced as being very unpleasant. And so people really are trying to find a way to not feel this, especially if it's something that feels prolonged or like it's um, something that they just can't kind of snap themselves out of. We hear, you know, people really hungry for a way to feel a little bit better and to feel something that feels calmer. So those are some of the emotions that caregivers are typically experiencing. Um, and let's just talk for a minute about who are caregivers. So again, this really varies across the board, but you know, we have some people who are parents who are still 
um, taking care of a very young, energetic, active family. They have minors at home. Um, but this can also extend through the lifespan. We see people who are caring for spouses or partners. Um, we see grandparents who, especially in this last year, um, when a lot of people had their uh, kids have, you know, having to do virtual learning, a lot of grandparents were pulled in to um, help navigate some of the online learning or to fill in where maybe you know schools and daycares were no longer open and they they had to step into that caregiving role. We also hear about adult children or other family members who are caring for their parents or older family members. And then we also have professional caregivers. So, you know, people who their work is providing care to other people. Um, and so that can be very taxing if they're already kind of feeling um, overwhelmed with what's going on in their personal life. So we kind of touched on this, but typically who is being cared for? It could be children, grandchildren. Um, more often we hear about partners who have medical needs or mental health needs, older family members. And then again, if they're in a profession of providing care, their clientele. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, just a survey that was done by the National Alliance for Caregiving and the AARP. They put out an online survey and um, tallied the results and put together a summary called Caregiving in the U.S. 2020. And what they really sought to find out, now this really was looking for people who were providing care to someone 18 years or older. So the, the following statistics may not necessarily apply to people who are providing care for younger um, minors or, or kind of in that parenting role. But this kind of the way they even phrased that prompt when they were asking the question for these surveys was, you know, kind of finding out, you know, are you helping anybody with personal needs or household chores? You know, are you managing someone's finances or arranging for outside services? Are you visiting regularly? Um, you know, the adult does not need to live with you. And I thought that was such a great question to kind of think about because there's really a huge spectrum in terms of how intense people are. Um, providing care. So we have some people who maybe have a fairly peripheral role where they, you know, maybe, you know, just jump in here and there as needed to some people who are providing really intensive, um, you know, unpaid care for a family member where they're doing a lot of physical um, work and helping the person to care for their, you know, daily living skills and um, maybe doing tons of grocery shopping or things like that. So we see a pretty wide spectrum in terms of um, how involved somebody is as a caregiver. So in terms of the summary, um, they found that three out of five caregivers identified as female with a median age of 51. 24% um, of those who responded were caring not just for one person, but for multiple people. And then the breakdown in terms of how people identified racially, 60% of the respondent, respondents were non-Hispanic um, white, 17% identified as Latinx, 14% identified as African American or Black, 5% identified as Asian American or Pacific Islander, and 3% identified as being multiracial or a different group that was not um, in one of the other categories. So I just wanted to take a couple little slides here to highlight some of the profiles of typical caregivers. Um, you know, you may not see yourself in one of the groups represented, but this just gives a little bit of an, um, an some context in thinking okay. about what yep. kinds of things people Dr. might Dr. Moran. Uh, yeah. You cut out um, as soon as you said, um, so, like after profiles of some um, caregivers. Oh, okay. I'll go back. Thank you. <laughs> Sure. So um, I wanted to give these profiles of typical caregivers. So even if you don't recognize yourself in one of the groups that I'm talking about, it just highlights the um, sort of complexity of, you know, cultural expectations, um, resources that, you know, could be different across all caregivers. So just some things to think about in terms of how much stress, you know, may be experienced and how that could be different for different people. 
So this first slide um, just summarizes that study that I mentioned um, a bit ago, pulled out information specifically for African American or black caregivers. They found that the average age was 47. These caregivers were more often unmarried with lower incomes. They were typically caring for a parent, spouse, or grandparent with an average age or an average of 1.7 conditions. 50% of the time, the person they were caring for lived with them. They had been providing care an average of five years, um, and they were more often than not the only caregiver. So you can already imagine that that's probably going to be pretty high intensity, which they said that it was, with, and that meant providing a really high number of hours of care for the other person. Most were still working, but reported impacts on their work and finances. So you can imagine that this is somebody, um, you know, somebody with this type of profile would, would experience stress in a number of different ways. For Asian American caregivers, they found the average age was 49. Um, this caregiver typically was married with a higher education and higher income. Um, they were typically providing care for their parent with an average age of 69 with 1.7 conditions. 50% of the time they lived with the person they were providing care for. Um, they reported the level of intensity as being moderate, but they were more likely to manage that person's finances. And they had an average of 4.7 years of caregiving. Um, they usually did have help from other unpaid caregivers, which usually suggests other family members were more likely to be involved. They were usually still working. And many found it to be emotionally stressful, but were more likely to seek support from other health professionals. So they were more likely to seek out um, support from other resources. For our Latinx caregivers, they found that the average age was 43. So we see that's a little bit younger than the other groups we talked about before. They're typically married and have children under the age of 18 at home. So, you know, sometimes we hear about the, the sandwich generation, which is, you know, people who are having to care for people who are still, you know, young and in the house, but also having to care for older generations. And so you can see, you can imagine how much stress that provides. These um, individuals tended to report lower household incomes and education. They were usually caring for a parent or grandparent average age of 66 with 1.8 conditions, had been on average caregiving for four years. Often the person was in their home. Again, that high intensity caregiving situation with moderate to high level of physical strain as well. Many were still working, but less often had access to health insurance and reported inadequate long-term planning. So one more group to go over and then we'll kind of move on, but for um, caregivers in the LGBTQ plus community, the average age was again, a bit lower at 42. They were often unmarried and were caring for a parent or grandparent 65 or older. Um, most of the time, the person they were caring for either lived with them or within the 20 minute radius. The Dr. Dr. Moran, yeah. you cut out after often unmarried. Oh gosh, okay. Um, so, you know, the, the typical person here was reporting that they were caring for a parent or grandparent, 65 or older, um, most often living with them or within 20 minutes. The caregiving was high intensity. Um, they reported high levels of financial strain, but they were more often paid hourly than on a salary basis. And they found the caregiving to be moderately to highly emotionally stressful. Okay, so I wanted to talk more specifically around what is stressful for caregivers. So, you know, oftentimes we hear people talking about dueling appointments. So if you're providing care for someone, you're often in charge of helping them to get to their own medical appointments or to their, you know, get their, own, their errands done or, um, you know, kind of anything that they need, you're in charge of helping them to organize that and get there and implement it. But, you know, for somebody who is in need of their own care, they have their own medical appointments. And I have to say that in my years of working with caregivers, I often hear the caregiver will often default to prioritizing the other person's appointments to the point of maybe missing their own or maybe not being as consistent with their own screenings or their own appointments. And so this can put the caregiver at risk for 
um, not prioritizing their own health. We also see a huge struggle with work-life balance. So um, work being maybe if they're actually, you know, still working, but work also including caregiving responsibilities. So if they are providing care to someone else, they are maybe not going to have as much time or energy left to focus on some of the things that bring them joy or that are, you know, self-care for them. We also see with caregivers that there's a stress around managing their own finances and managing the finances of the person they're providing care for. Um, there's a role strain. So again, we might see for um, somebody who is, for example, an adult child providing care for a parent, um, that's a very different dynamic than what probably had existed throughout the lifespan up until that point. So it feels very, very different to be stepping into that role. We also see, again, for people who have been providing care to now need care, that it becomes uncomfortable to ask others for help. It, it may feel like it's a burden or a strain on somebody else. And so we see that can be very stressful. And then again, just insufficient support. So whether or not that is financial, it could be time. So maybe people are reporting they don't have enough time to do what they need to do. Um, interpersonally, maybe they just don't have the connections with others who can offer a little bit of support. They don't have somebody that they feel like they can vent to. Um, and, you know, maybe they also don't have somebody who can share the caregiving responsibilities. So these are just some examples of specific stressors that caregivers might feel. And the research backs that up. So 36% of the caregivers who responded um, to this particular survey reported that the caregiving role was in fact highly stressful. And the American Psychological Association also found that for caregivers who are between the ages of 55 and 75, that they do show 23% higher levels of stress hormones than their peers. So if we're not careful, this can lead to burnout where we have people experiencing anger, anxiety, denial, depression, irritability, sleeplessness, social withdrawal, difficulty concentrating, health problems, weight changes, apathy, which is when somebody is just not really feeling very motivated to do things, even if it was something that they used to find joy in. Um, and then also, you know, the potential for increased substance use as a way to cope. So a lot of times when people experience burnout, they also feel a lot of guilt around not being able to provide the care that they had been doing before. And um, they usually feel just really unpleasant and uncomfortable. Some of the things that can impact how likely someone is to experience burnout is how many hours they're spending caregiving or if they're living with the person, how isolated they are from others, if they're dealing with depression or financial concerns, lack of coping strategies, and then lack of choice. So if they feel like they don't really have a choice as to whether or not they can be in that caregiving role, that can increase their stress level. So I would encourage you to write this link down. So if you go on the Health and Aging website they, and, and look through their um, website, there is a quiz that you can take online and you can fill in the answers and it will give you a little of, a bit of an assessment in terms of how you're doing. And I would encourage you to do it even if you feel like you're doing okay. Um, I've had a number of people where we've done this in person, they have found that um, they were surprised to see that, you know, some of the things that they had sort of gotten used to, so maybe, you know, not sleeping as well or, or kind of feeling low a lot of the time, um, you know, this kind of highlighted for them that maybe they weren't paying attention to that and that maybe the caregiver stress was impacting them more than they thought. So I would encourage you to head to that website and to take that quiz as a little assessment for how um, you were doing. But now let's segue into what we can do about it. So I think we've highlighted how it can be stressful and why it can be stressful, but 
what we really want to know is how to make it a little bit better. So if anybody has gone on a flight, you've heard the message every time that you have to put your oxygen mask on yourself before you put it on the people around you. And for caregivers, this can feel really counterintuitive because your whole focus in a caregiving role is making sure that the other people around you are okay. But the reason you have to put your oxygen mask on yourself first is because you're not going to be any good or of any help to somebody next to you if you can't function. So the whole idea here is that you, as the person who's providing care, take care of yourself first. It's not selfish. It's important. It's necessary. And then that helps you to be able to provide care for the other people around you with higher quality and for a longer period of time. So the first thing that I would highly recommend is just looking for support. Um, there's actually a number of caregiver support groups out there. I'm gonna post um, some websites at the end of this presentation so that you can look for groups that maybe fit best for you. Um, if you have somebody that you're caring for that has a very specific um, you know, probably maybe like a cognitive decline or something like that. There is actually very specific groups out there um, for that. And sometimes their care providers may actually have good resources that they can recommend. It's also important to carve out time to connect with a friend. And I know for a lot of people, this feels impossible because there's just not enough time to do so but you can get creative with it. So even combining errands, you know, if you have to go to the grocery store, having a friend meet up with you at the grocery store to kind of walk around while you're doing something that you have to do anyway. Um, or if you have to go, you know, take somebody to an appointment, but you have that hour to kind of just sit there and hang out while they're doing that, maybe the friend can meet you there and you can, you know, catch up that way. Or maybe that would be a good time to schedule a phone date. I also think, you know, a lot of people have forgotten the art of writing letters, but I think writing a letter to somebody can be a really wonderful um, experience. First of all, people still love to get mail that's not just junk mail, um, but the way that we communicate through writing can feel very different than how you might communicate just chatting or talking on the phone. And, you know, the response that you might get by letter may also feel different in terms of the quality of communication that you might have. The benefit of that is also that you can kind of do that when you have time. Um, so there are still creative ways to get just even small doses of connection with others, even if you don't have plenty of time to, um, you know, go out and do something more significant with someone else. We also want to make sure that you're just meeting your most basic needs. So, you know, I know I mentioned before medical appointments, caregivers will often kind of prioritize somebody else's medical appointments. We wanna make sure that you really prioritize what you need to do for your treatment and, you know, for your follow-up appointments throughout time, whether those are screenings or, you know, just your annual appointments, but that you, you make those and that you keep those because that will keep you healthy. We also, you know, want you to kind of be thinking about like, are you eating your three meals a day? You know, when people are, you know, maybe physically not feeling well or are struggling with time and just being able to structure your day around all the different obligations that you have, it's still incredibly important to properly nourish your body and to fuel yourself. So a lot of times people kind of underestimate if you're not eating consistently or you're not hydrating, properly, your mood is actually going to be down. So sometimes people will say that they feel really down or really anxious, and actually they're just eating in kind of a chaotic way. And just eating consistently and drinking your water and getting good sleep can actually really help with how you're feeling, not only emotionally, but also physically. And then shelter is a basic need, but I wanted to kind of put that on there as just to kind of highlight that, you know, if you're struggling with food insecurity or um, financial concerns, make sure that people know because we can work with you to help you figure out different resources that might be available or to find assistance. So 
if those things are kind of hanging out there as stressors that are unresolved, that doesn't have to be the case. You know, we can help to alleviate some of those concerns. So when we think about people who are in a caregiving role, especially if they're also navigating their own treatment, we think about people who are gonna be really busy. So just a lot of motion, people jumping from one thing to another thing. And it's really important to try to find even just a little minute here and there to be still. So if people work with me, they know that some of my favorite, I call them mindfulness games, are, you know, look out a window and just, can you find three birds? You know, can you look around? They're usually there. Um, you might have to look in the sky. You might have to look in the tree or on the ground. If you can't see any, maybe pause and see if you can hear any. And then if you can hear them, then you can look for them. So just try to use your senses to stay in the moment. Another one that I like to recommend is just taking 10 mindful breaths. So this is something that you can do absolutely anywhere. So what you would do is you would, in your mind, just kind of be counting to yourself, but you breathe in and when you breathe in and you count your, to yourself one, and then as you exhale, you count two, and then inhale three, exhale four, and you just do that to 10. Usually what happens when you're focusing on that is you get those nice good belly breaths that are more relaxing and calming than if you're anxious and you tend to be breathing from your chest. So we're trying to kind of use your senses to stay in the moment and get out of some of the stress and the noise that's happening in your mind. I also recommend just even setting a timer for one minute. And for that one minute, you just stop and you just breathe or you just listen to sounds. Um, you know, right now when I'm recording this, there's a lot of cicada sounds, but um, you know, you can just go outside and listen to, you know, how many different sounds can you hear in one minute? If you find those to be kind of challenging, you know, it might also be nice just to take a little bit of time to journal or to, um, you know, again, write a letter to a friend, but just something where you're just kind of calmly doing something still. I also really recommend joyful movement. So this is a little bit different from what I consider to be sometimes punishing exercise where people will feel like they have to go out and really get sweaty or, you know, sprint on a treadmill or do something that feels like um, intense exercise. Joyful movement, I think of as being more focused on just, you know, enjoying being in your body and doing something that's fun. Um, so for some people, this could be, you know, just gentle yoga or Pilates, you know, it could be walking or going for a hike, it could be dancing. I've heard people talk about roller skating or riding a bike. Um, so, you know, kind of feeling in your body, like what you're physically capable of doing and what would actually feel good to you. You know, for some people, it's just getting up and stretching your legs or, you know, just walking around the house a couple times, but just doing a little bit of movement can really help bring that stress reduction. It can really help with the stress reduction and again, kind of help alleviate some of the uncomfortable emotions that you might be having. The other thing we wanna talk about is just doing hobbies in small doses. And sometimes people have been so busy for so long that they've almost forgotten the kinds of things that used to bring them joy or the kinds of things that they used to like to do. I actually had a little bit of this recently where um, you know, for decades, I went to sleep without using an iPad or anything. And at one point, my iPad wasn't working. And I had to remind myself that forever, I used to actually just read before <laughs> I went to bed. And it was lovely. So, you know, just thinking about little things that you might like to do that you can do a little bit here and there. So for some people, this would be crafting or painting. It could be doing crossword puzzles or watching shows, reading. Um, some people like to watch sports, travel, and even if travel is something that's not available to you, you know, it could be just doing a small little field trip to a different park or a garden that you can go sit in that's a little bit of a change of scenery from what you've been seeing. Um, that can be a nice change of pace. Uh, for some people, it's photography, music. So, you know, you get the idea here, just anything that 
you know, might be something that you would enjoy doing. And again, you could just do for, you know, five or 10 minutes at a time, even though it feels really small, just doing that can make such a huge difference in your overall stress level. This one is hard for a lot of people, but we really need to practice the art of delegating. Um, and so for people who are in treatment or who are feeling overwhelmed, it's important to adjust your expectations for what you can actually provide. So what you're physically and emotionally able to do. Um, and that often means needing to seek out support from somewhere else. So one thing that you can do is allow other people to help and be specific in what you're asking for. Um, so one thing that might be helpful is to create a calendar. So at the start of each month saying, here's all the different appointments that, you know, need to get done. These are going to be some of the areas where we're going to have a hard time, you know, making ends meet, or it's going to be really hard to make dinners those weeks. And, you know, in my experience, a lot of people really want to help. They just really don't know how, um, but if you give them a specific task or, you know, send out a list and say, here are the things we need help with for the month. People are really happy to actually um, sign up for a task because that feels good to them to be able to provide help. And it gives them a really clear list of things that are needed and they can kind of pick which time works for them and um, maybe an activity that's sort of a strength of theirs. So you might make a list of potential helpers and, you know, Kind of manage your own feelings of guilt. I know a lot of people have a really hard time asking for help from other people, but I, again, people usually really are happy to help and want to help. They just need a, an invitation and be a specific task. And so if you can email out to a group of helpers, here's the things that we're needing help with. I think you might be surprised at how happy people are to jump in to provide extra support. I also really encourage people to learn to advocate for themselves and for the person that you're caring for. So I think sometimes people feel like, again, they don't wanna be a burden or they don't wanna um, you know, take up too much of anyone's time. But you know, before your appointments with a you know, provider, it's really a great idea to make a list of questions and also to be assertive. Let people know how you're doing and what you feel like you need. Um, again, a lot of times your providers are gonna be aware of resources that you may not know even exist. And if they knew that you were having a hard time or if you felt really kind of uncertain about how to handle something, they could point you in the right direction for finding resources to help support you with whatever situation that you have going on. Um, so, you know, we have tons and tons of resources available. So if you ever feel like you just need more help than you're getting, you know, be sure to ask, make sure that we know what you need so that we can help to get you um, hopefully connected with the right people. We also wanna make sure that you're taking time just to nurture yourself. So, you know, this could be prioritizing just time for relaxation. It could be a mini spa day. Um, you know, I, and I'm not talking like you have to actually go to a spa, but like even just getting, you know, some lotion or something from the store and just having a day where you kind of just take care of yourself and, um, you know, do something that feels nurturing for your body. And then there's other things, you know, acupuncture, yoga, healing touch, therapy, massage, any of those things can be so therapeutic and so helpful and help you to feel like you're caring for yourself. And again, when you're taking care of yourself, you're able to provide um, better quality care and longer lasting care for other people. So I wanted to take a few minutes to do one of my favorite therapy um, little tasks that we have. Um, so there is a type of therapy called acceptance and commitment therapy. And one of the things that is a really huge part of that therapy is encouraging people to live a life consistent with their values. And the idea is that when you're kind of feeling a little out of whack or like your life is just kind of not exactly where you want it to be, it's more often the case that you're not living consistent with your value set. 
And so when we talk about values, we're talking about things that you alone in a vacuum would want in different areas of your life, even if other people would want something different. So, for example, some people really value friendship and they want to see their friends as much as possible. Another person may not really feel like a strong need to have a lot of friends. And both of those things are okay. It's just what is specific to what you as an individual want for yourself. So there's a little exercise. So, you know, for those of you who have, um, you know, paper or pen, this would be a great time to get this out. And what we're looking at are these are the main value categories. So there's romantic relationships. And if you're somebody who doesn't currently have a romantic relationship, but you would like one, that could still be an important value to you, even if it doesn't feel like it's happening. Um, parenting, same thing. So, you know, if somebody is not currently a parent, but they really want to be, parenting could still be a very important value for them. Then there's other family relationships. There's friends, employment, education, citizenship, and citizenship really kind of speaks to community involvement. Um, for some people, this could be um, being involved in political campaigns. For some people, it could be volunteer. For some people, it's just about recycling instead of throwing everything in the trash. So, you know, again, it's sort of specific to how you interpret that. Spirituality is the same way. So with spirituality, this could be you know, for people who maybe are really active and involved in an organized religion, but it could also be how somebody who, you know, just really enjoys being in nature might kind of think of it. So again, that's very specific to each individual. And then recreation is how you, you know, fill your time doing things that you like. So travel or hobbies or sports or things like that. And then the last category is your physical and mental health. So what you would do is you would go down on your piece of paper and in the importance column, you would rank each category on a scale from one to 10. So one being not important and 10 being really important. Everything could be a 10, so it doesn't have to be this one's one, this one's two, this one's three. It's really each individual one you're ranking on a scale of one to 10. So if you want to, you can take a minute and go down and rank on a scale of one to 10, how important each of those things is to you. And I'll pause for a minute so that people have the opportunity to do that. And then what you'll do is you'll go through in the next column, which is the manifestation column, and you're going to rate yourself on how well you're doing in that area. So on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being like terrible and 10 being pretty okay, you rank yourself in terms of how you're doing for each of those categories. So you might notice as you do that that you might be spending more time in a category that's not that important to you, um, or you might really have something important to you that just doesn't feel like you're paying very much attention to at all. So you're gonna go through and you're gonna rank each one from one to 10 in terms of how well you think you're doing. So I'll give you a minute for that as well.
And for those of you who are watching this later, you have the benefit of hitting pause if you need more time. But that third column is really just the difference between those two numbers. So for example, if romantic relationships are a 10 in terms of importance, but I don't really feel like I'm doing so much there. I'd actually just rate myself as kind of like a five in terms of how much energy and effort I'm kind of putting into it. That difference is gonna be a five. So you're gonna go through and look at each of those categories and find the difference in terms of score for how important something is and your manifestation score. So I'll give you a minute to do that as well. And then when you have those numbers, what you'll notice is that the difference numbers that are bigger are going to be areas where you need a little bit more work. So, for example, you know, if you are somebody who is spending a lot of time in, you know, the caregiving role, you might say that, you know, that other family part might have a huge manifestation score. And you might see that some of the other areas of your life have big scores where they're not really meeting up. So maybe you actually really would love to spend more time with friends, but that's not happening. So what you can look at when there is those big numbers in the difference column is starting to think about small ways that you can make some shifts to highlight some of those other areas of your life to give them a little bit of attention. So, you know, for me personally, I love to do this every once in a while just to get a little snapshot of how I'm doing or if I feel like something's just a little bit off. This is a great way to just sit down, kind of take a little snapshot of my life and figure out where some of the problems are. So for me personally, I'm, you know, I work full time, I have a young family, so I'm constantly running my kids everywhere. Um, the friend category for me is one in which I tend to find that there's a pretty big discrepancy. And so, for example, what I might do and have done in the past is say, okay, I'm just going to make a goal to make two <laughs> times per month a time where I have a contact with a friend or I go out with a friend or, you know, maybe write a letter to a friend, but just two times a month that that's going to be my little goal. And even though that might sound kind of small, it can make a huge difference because, you know, I, I love my friends. I just, you know, sometimes forget that it's been a few months since I've seen them. So for me personally, that can be really helpful to kind of get me back on track and to feel like that area of my life is sort of coming back together. So that's an example of how you might look through here and kind of make a little goal for yourself. Um, a lot of times I'll hear people say something like, I used to go to church and I'm not really sure why I stopped going to church. And so they may make a goal to, you know, go to church once a month or just something small like that. And then that feels like that is helping them to live a life that's more consistent with their values. So this is one of my favorite little therapy techniques that I use, and hopefully you find it helpful too. So I also want to just put up here, these are some websites where there's lots of really great resources for people who are caregivers. Um, you know, this is a great place to get lots of information, to find out about support groups, to find out about, you know, respite or other resources that might be available. And again, you know, always reach out to us at the Wellness Center or to your other providers. If you feel like you are in over your head with something or you just feel like you're, you're reaching that point of burnout, reach out to us and we can, you know, point you in the right direction to hopefully find some resources for you to feel like you can, um, you know, bring your stress level down and get the support that's needed. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And oh, if not, 
um, you know, you can always feel free to reach out to me at the wellness center as well. Dr. Moran, it's Jenny. How are you? Good. How are you? Good, good, good. I'm sorry. I wasn't able to start with you at the beginning, but um, it's been incredible. 3 fourths of the way through. So thank you very much. Oh, um, I don't know that I see any questions right now. Um, but as we've said in other events that we've had so far that if people do have any questions, they can um, contact us as you, you said as well um, and let Lindsay know we can get them answered for you or we can get an appointment set up for you. Um, but it's, it's been really great. I do really appreciate that last exercise. Um, I am caring for my parents right now. They're living with me since the beginning of the pandemic. So a lot of this was very pertinent. And then I know for a lot of our patients, as you've realized, and that's why you wanted to give this talk is that they're in the middle of all of taking care of themselves and needing to take care of themselves as well as having their caregiver roles. So um, this is really very, very valuable and um, we recorded it as Lindsay said, so people will be able to archive it and watch it and um, get all the benefit from it, even at a later date. Great, and it's been my pleasure and I'm happy again to answer questions for people at a later date. If they watch this and they want to know a little bit more, please feel free to reach out at any time. Okay, wonderful. Very good. Well, thank you again, Dr. Moran. We'll see you soon. All right. Thank you. Everybody. Bye bye.